we're really glad that you are here, and we're really glad for sunshine, but it just equals that you're warm in here, and that's okay, right? Because we're happy for sunshine, but hey, we are glad that you are here today. Uh, I know you've heard that from a couple of us, but it means a lot to us that you're joining us on your Sunday morning. My name is Di, and I'm part of the staff here at our central campus, and uh, I'm going to share in just a moment, but I'm going to do the uh, a little bit different way to open the message and ask if you will just join me in prayer first. In fact, if you will bow your heads with me and maybe even put one hand or both hands over your heart as just a symbol of being willing to be open, would you do that with me? God, we come before you today in all kinds of need for you. Some in this room maybe are here to support someone being baptized or maybe are here to check a box or f because they feel like they're supposed to be here. Some are here because they're hungry for you. Some are desperately in need of you moving in their life. And God, actually, all of us are desperately in need of you moving in our lives. So would you move today? Would you speak to us through your word? God, would you stir inside of us a hunger for you and you alone? And would you be glorified here? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you are joining us in our Game of Thrones series, which is uh, our effort to make our way through the first couple of kings of Israel. It's actually a mammoth amount of scripture to cover, so we're kind of hitting high points. And I thought it would be good in case maybe you hadn't been here the last couple of weeks, you've missed one, or this is your first time, or maybe you just need a little refresher, if I just kind of bring us up to speed on what we've covered so far. So, so far, uh, we have introduced to you the first king of Israel. His name is Saul. And Saul was described in the Bible as the most handsome man in all of Israel. So he had that going for him. Also, he was described as head and shoulders above every other person in Israel. And this was meant to describe his height, but it was also meant to describe his attributes. So he really was just kind of head and shoulders above everyone else. And Saul starts off as king really well. He starts off with a love for God, a desire to please God, but somewhere along the way he lost that. And because he lost that love for God and that desire to put God first, the Bible says, first of all, that God regretted making Saul king. And second of all, that God removed his spirit or his covering from Saul. I always wonder if Saul even knew that God had left him. If Saul is in a place where he is continuing to carry out kingly roles, but he's doing it without God's covering. And so God sends his servant Samuel, who was a prophet at the time, with a flask of oil to go and anoint the next king of Israel. And that was where we were introduced to David. Dave was David was young at this point, probably between 10 and 13 years old, so really young. And uh, Samuel is sent to his family, where David is the watcher of the sheep and the goats out in the field. And Samuel, uh, God speaks to Samuel and says, this is the one. And so scripture says that Samuel then anoints David with oil. Now, this was a physical anointing. It was supposed to symbolize that God has chosen you. It was also, it was a promise, essentially, of what is to come, but is not yet. And so Samuel obeyed. He poured the oil over David. But I want you to catch something, because not only was this a physical anointing, but there was something spiritual, something supernatural happening here as well when David was anointed. Uh, if you have your Bible, I'd love for you to turn to 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, so you can see this for yourself. Uh, your electronic Bible will work too. Otherwise, the words will be on the screen for you to follow along. So this is 1 Samuel 16, 13. So here we have David. He's standing among his brothers. Samuel took the flask of olive oil that he had brought, and he anointed David with the oil. So that's the physical anointing. And scripture says, catch this, and the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. So there was the physical anointing, the actual oil poured over him, but there was something beyond that. There was the presence, the powerful presence of the spirit of God that was on David and it remained on him from that day forward. There was a supernatural anointing on this young man. Following the story, Last week, we picked up the story where David, as a young teenager, so soon after that, uh, his country, Israel, is at war with the Philistines, and a particularly gigantic man named Goliath, probably nine feet tall, is taunting the Israelites, and so David steps in and says, I will go and fight Goliath, 
And this is a ridiculous match. It took a ton of courage. This young boy stands up against Goliath. He kills Goliath, which then causes all of Israel to chase down all of the Philistines and wipe them out. And now they have succeeded in victory over the Philistines. And David takes the head of Goliath to then King Saul and delivers it to him as his prize. You can imagine David became very popular after this. And so the people started to make up songs about both Saul and David. And the songs went something like this. Saul has killed thousands, but David has killed tens of thousands. And Saul did not appreciate this song very much. And so if you will flip over in scripture uh, to 1 Samuel 18, I want you to see what happens in Saul's heart immediately after David kills Goliath. So this is in 1 Samuel 18. We'll pick it up in verse 8. It said, this made Saul very angry. What made him angry? The dumb song about Saul killing thousands, but David killing ten thousands. Probably on top of that is how popular David is and how much favor he has and the anointing that's on him. But it says, this made Saul very angry. What's this? He said, they credit David with ten thousands and me with only thousands. Next, they'll be making him their king. Little did he know. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Now Saul is, at this moment, overcome by jealousy. Okay? That's essentially what happens. Uh, he sees the favor on David. He hears the people singing about him. But he also can see this anointing on him. Now, he does not know about the physical anointing of oil. He wouldn't have known about that. But he can see that there's something that sets this man, this young man, apart and he is incredibly jealous of it. It's not by accident that once Saul is overcome by this jealousy, he goes to a very dark place. If you look at the next verse, verse 10, it says the very next day, the very next day after the jealousy takes over, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul, and he began to rave in his house like a madman. Some translations say that this spirit filled Saul with great depression and fear. And the only thing, according to the council that Saul had around him, the wise people that served him, the only thing they could come up with to cure Saul or to bring him relief was to bring a talented musician, scripture says, into his presence who could play an instrument under an anointing that would bring relief from the tormenting spirits for Saul. And who did they bring into Saul's presence to play this instrument? David. David, under an anointing, under the Spirit of God resting powerfully on him, every time he would play, all the torment Saul was experiencing would be at peace, and Saul would find peace in that presence. But, of course, David could not play 24-7. And so eventually, as the torment and as the jealousy continues to grow, as the mental and emo emotional health continue to decline, uh, Saul becomes murderous. And Saul attempts to kill David, and, and he didn't just attempt to kill him once. In fact, every day for the rest of his life was spent trying to kill David. It was spent pursuing him and seeking him out in order to destroy him. Did you catch that Saul's jealousy is what led him here? It was jealousy that took him down the dark path. It was jealousy that brought the darkness and the decline in his life. It was jealousy. And if you hear me emphasize anything today, I want you to hear me say, if you give jealousy any space in your life at all, it will take you down. Jealousy is what tells you that you deserve something more than he does or she does. Jealousy is what says you got robbed or you got wronged. Jealousy is what says uh, I can tear that person down in order to elevate myself. Jealousy is what feels threatened by what's happening in the people's lives around you. Jealousy bears no good fruit at all. In fact, the fruit it bears is bitterness and poison and death. Fast forward just for one second to the end of the story, which is David does become crowned king. He does inherit the kingship. He does see God's promise to him come to pass. But I want you to hear me say that more important than that moment in David's life, the moment where it comes to pass, 
the moment where the crown is put on his head, that moment he's been waiting for, way more important than that is every moment leading up to that moment where he is planting and nurturing the characteristics in him that he will need in order to be the king that God needs him to be. And we live our life in that spot all the time where we are waiting for the thing, waiting for the fulfillment, waiting for the dream, whatever it is, and we are nurturing the characteristics now that are needed for when we arrive there. David had a lot of characteristics that we should want to emulate. And rather than have a four-hour message, I thought I would try and pick a few, which was a lot harder than I thought it would be, actually. Uh, so I did choose a few. I thought about calling this message the characteristics of a king. And then I could picture all of you tuning out because none of you are planning to be a king in your life. Most of you are just trying to survive today. And so I thought, what is it about David that I want to be like? And David is described in scripture, and Brandon preached on this a couple weeks ago, as a man after God's own heart. Or maybe for your case, in my case, a woman after God's own heart. In other words, David was a God lover. He loved God. His life was about loving and pursuing God. And so today, I want to give you just a couple characteristics I believe are characteristics of a God lover. With me? First characteristic of a God lover, as seen in the life of David, is honor. Now, for years, Saul and his men pursued David to kill him. In fact, for year, chapters 1 Samuel 19 through 30, that's just Saul's men and Saul relentlessly pursuing David. I just summed it up for you. You should still read it. It's good. But that's, that's essentially the message. Here's David, anointed to be king, on the run, living as a fugitive, hiding, trying not to be murdered with his ba a small band of friends living in caves. It's interesting, though, to note that David had more than one opportunity to kill Saul. But David refused to take that opportunity. He considered it criminal to kill the Lord's anointed, is what he called Saul. Because he is the Lord's anointed until the Lord decides to remove him from that position. And that was David's perspective. Who am I to take out this man that God has chosen for this position until God himself chooses to remove him from that position? So he showed respect for the position, even though I bet it's likely he did not agree with how Saul lived, the choices he was making, and how he was leading. Regardless of how he felt about how Saul was making his choices and leading, he still respected the position that that man held. And that respect was evident throughout his life. Now, Saul or David did not take the opportunity to physically kill Saul, but he also didn't take the opportunity to figuratively kill Saul. You agree with me probably that there's more than one way to kill a person. Have you been to a youth sporting event ever? I always feel sad that you laugh because I laugh too. And then I feel really sad inside because human beings murder refs and coaches and five-year-olds kicking a soccer ball with their mouth for no one knows why. Have you heard how people talk about other churches or other pastors or other ministries? Have you heard the things that come out of people's mouths that are murderous? It's as if that murder and that slander and that gossip is somehow going to elevate us. This secret hope that maybe another church will fail or another ministry won't make it. Why? So we win so that we look better than the church that completely failed? This helps nobody. But we are murderous with our mouths. And I think we would do well to learn the characteristic of honor because some of you in this room, your mouth is your absolute undoing. I'm going to ask you this, and it's pretty direct. Would anyone even know you're a God lover if they heard the way that you talk? The way you talk about anybody. Leaders, government officials, the president. How you talk about boss, former boss, spouse, ex-spouse, parents, step-parents, kids, someone, your enemy, someone you don't like. We murder with our mouth all the time. And I want you to understand that our honor of other people does not necessarily show that we 
approve of the way that they are living or the choices that they're making or the way that they are leading, but it shows respect for the position that they hold. It also shows that we have this trust for God that they will stand before God at some point in their life and they will give an account for how they live and led and so will we. Honor is what causes teams to shake hands after a game. Honor is what causes fighters to hug after they just beat the tar out of each other. Honor is what celebrates a coworker's uh, promotion or another church's victory. Honor is what understands my very lowly position in this world. And honor is what elevates the people around me. Honor is what keeps jealousy away. And honor is absolutely required as a characteristic of a God lover. So the first one is honor. The second characteristic, I believe, is obedience. If you look at 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1, it starts off with these two words, after this. After what? After Saul has received word, or David has received word that Saul has died, and after David has grieved the death of Saul. The guy that has been pursuing him for seven years, trying to murder him. Saul, or David grieved the death of Saul, and then after this, it says, David asked the Lord, should I move back to one of the towns of Judah? Yes, the Lord replied. And then David asked, which town should I go to? To Hebron, the Lord answered. So Saul is dead. I don't know if your mind goes here, but this is where my mind goes. I start thinking, well, if you're David, isn't it sort of a good assumption that now this whole promise you've been given to become king is sort of just rightfully yours? There was a guy in that position taking up the space. He's not here anymore. Now it's rightfully mine. Isn't that a logical assumption? David does not make that assumption. In fact, he, doesn't, he not only doesn't assume, he asks God, what do you want me to do next? And God said, I want you to move. And the reason that David asked this question, the reason for this obedience is because David is a God lover. And the thing about a God lover is they want to obey not because they're afraid of God or not because they're afraid of God's judgment or that God's going to be mad at them. It's because they want so desperately to be close to God, as close as possible, no space in between them, that obedience is the natural fruit that comes from it. So instead of forcing the kingship, David instead asks, should I move my family, incidentally, this is his hometown, to Judah, to where my family lives, to where I grew up? And God says, yes. And so David moves his family, and scripture says, and then the men of Judah came to David, and they anointed him king over the people of Judah. Even though Saul is gone, David still has not inherited the full completion of this promise. Now he's king over Judah, which is just two tribes of all of Israel. It's just a tiny portion. And I just have to say, this has to be confusing to David. This, this has to be like a, hey, I didn't think I would be here at this point in my life. Also, side note, didn't think that for seven years I'd be running and hiding in caves when you anointed me to be king, God. But because David is a God lover, he remains honoring and he remains obedient. And his desire is to be close to God. And you might be there today as well. Maybe you're in a place where you're just waiting for something that God has promised you. Maybe you're waiting for reconciliation in your family, or you're waiting for um, your marriage to be restored, or maybe you're waiting for your kids to come home, or maybe you're waiting for healing in your body, or whatever it is. David models for us. Remain honoring, remain obedient. And that's what shows your trust in God. The third characteristic of a God lover, I believe, is tenacity. Tenacity is the willingness to train hard. It's the willingness to pursue hard, even when it hurts, even when it's hard, even when it's frustrating, even where you aren't where you thought you would be at this point in your life. This tenacity thing is your and my refusal to quit because quitting is everywhere, all around us. People quit on their health. People quit on relationships. People quit on their dreams. And people quit on their marriages every day. People quit because pretty much anything that's, hard, or that's worth anything is hard. And so they quit because it's hard. And tenacity says, I won't quit when it's hard. Did you know, this is a little fun fact for you. Did you know that this past July, uh, a man named Faja, 104 years old, ran a marathon? 
26.2 miles, people, 104 years old. Uh, I had to wonder what my excuse is. Um, except that he didn't start training for the marathons until he was in his 80s. So that's my excuse. I have a lot of time. So do you. <laughs> so at age 89, he ran a particularly grueling marathon, which is funny because I think they're all grueling sounding, but he runs this grueling one, and he, uh, he does it in record time. In fact, he beats the previous record by almost an hour at age 89. Do you know what category he ran in? Age 80 and up, which I didn't even know existed in marathons. <laughs> how, how does Faja, at 104 years old, run 26.2 miles? Tenacity. How do you stay married? Tenacity. How do you stay close to Jesus? Tenacity. It's your desire to work hard and your refusal to quit. And David spent a lot of time building this characteristic in his life. In fact, after the seven years of running from Saul, he then spent seven and a half years ruling just over Judah, which is not what he was promised, but he remained honoring and obedient uh, over those two tribes in the position that God had put him in, and he was tenacious in his pursuit of God. And because of that, 2 Samuel chapter 5 tells us the fulfillment of God's promise to David. After 14 and a half years, it says that all the tribes of Israel went to David at Hebron, and they told him, hey, we're your own flesh and blood. In the past, when Saul was our king, you were really the one leading us. And the Lord told you, you'll be the shepherd of the people of Israel. You will be Israel's leader. So there at Hebron, they anointed him king over all of Israel. He has finally seen the fulfillment of that promise. And that's not the end of his story. If you read the rest of 2 Samuel, you will see incredible victories and successes through the life of David. You will see incredible heartbreak and failure. You will also see incredible humility and repentance, all things we should want to emulate. But I want to go just to one more place, and that is I really truly believe the top three characteristics of David that we want to follow are honor, obedience, tenacity, but they are covered by one that is greater still. It's like an umbrella characteristic that rests over all of the others. It's something I want in my life. It's something I hope that you want in your life, and that is uh, a heart of worship. Let's go back just for a moment in our memory to the David that we first met in Scripture. The David that we first met in Scripture in 1 Samuel was the boy out in the fields watching the sheep and the goats. But the David that we see in that very same chapter, 1 Samuel 16, was also the talented young man who had an anointing over his life, who was a worshiper by heart, who was brought into the presence of Saul, so that when he played under that anointing with the gifting that God had given him, the tormenting spirits surrounding Saul had to flee. David was a worshiper. David was known as having a heart of worship, a man after God's own heart. His worship for God was probably often in a song. In fact, most of the psalms are written by David. But also, what I know about a worshiper is it just comes out all the time. And likely this is a, this is a young man who just worship for God just came out regularly. Worship for God came out when life was hard. Worship for God came out when it hurt. Worship for God came when he didn't understand why he was where he was. He worshiped God when a raving lunatic of a king was pursuing him, trying to kill him. He worshiped God when he wanted to quit. He worshiped God when he had to wait. His worship for God brought the Spirit of God resting powerfully on him. And that powerful presence of God is what caused tormenting spirits to have to flee in the atmosphere, in the vicinity of that young man. I want, I want that anointing on me. I want it. I want it not so I can pat myself on the back and say, I'm die and I have an anointing on me. I want it like you should want it because I want to walk into a place and I want the Spirit of God to rest so powerfully on me that it causes tormenting spirits on the lives of people I love as well as people I don't even know to have to flee. I want the yoke to be broken off of them. Listen to this. The book of Isaiah says there's a yoke of slavery that rests on people and it is broken off by the anointing. I want an anointing on me. I want it on you so that when we come in contact with somebody that's just under a yoke 
of slavery. They're in a dark place. They're in a place of torment or despair. They're in a place of not knowing what comes next or how to get there or how to break themselves out of what they're dealing with. That anointing on us, it breaks the yoke that is resting on people we love. How do we get that anointing? I mean, I'm just, I'm going to assume somebody in here wants it. If you don't, take notes for later. (laughs) But I want this anointing, so how do we get it? We get it by worshiping God. We get it by developing in us a heart of worship to pursue God, to pursue Him even when it's hard. And the thing is, when we become worshipers, when we develop a heart of worship, it keeps your heart soft. And when your heart is soft and you're pursuing God, this anointing can rest on you. And it's not something we can manufacture. It's the presence, the powerful presence of God that rests on us, that brings relief to the people around us. And here's the thing. When you have that anointing on you, you carry it with you. You carry it to the places you go. You want your family to change, you develop a heart of worship and you carry that anointing into your family. You want your marriage to change, you carry an anointing into that marriage. You develop a heart of worship. You carry that anointing into your home, into your workplace, into your family. Is anybody with me on this? Here's the thing, you carry that anointing into this place too. Because at any given moment and at every time we assemble here, there are somebodies, not just one somebody, but somebodies that are in this room that are under a yoke. They are enslaved. They are tormented. They feel hopeless. They're discouraged. They are not where they thought they would be at this point in their life. And when we come in here with the presence of God resting powerfully on us and we worship God because we have a heart of worship and because we desire to be close to him, We build an atmosphere in this place that sets the people free who are around us. And that is why we gather people. We don't gather just for what we can get from God. We gather so we can build an atmosphere where people find him. It's our responsibility. I'm going to close in prayer. I'm going to ask if you will bow your heads. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. We're going to practice worship in just a second. But first, I want to ask a question because I want to pray for you. So three questions. Number one, just heads are bowed. If you are in this place and you don't know God, and you realize first and foremost, I want to be free. I want to know God. Would you just raise your hand so I can include you in prayer? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Put your hands down. If you're in this place and you have walked away from God, sometimes we like to say it fluffy for you that you've drifted away. Maybe that's the case, but more than likely you have walked away. You have not been honoring with your mouth. You have not been obedient to the Lord. You have not been tenacious in your pursuit of him. Would you just raise your hand so I can include you in a prayer of recommitting your heart to God? Thank you, lots of you. And the last one would be, if you are here, maybe you already raised your hand for one of the other ones, but you raise it for this too. If you are here and you want the Spirit of God to rest powerfully on you, you want an anointing on you so that when you enter a room or you enter a circumstance or a situation, you want to bring that anointing with you that sets people free, would you raise your hand? Go ahead and put your hand down. Yes, every hand. Would you pray with me? God, we come before you as profoundly broken people who are in desperate need of your forgiveness. Would you fill us, God, with your love and your forgiveness? And God, we ask by your your spirit that is present in this room already that you would set people free from what has enslaved them, that you would relieve those who have experienced torment or darkness or depression. God, we pray that there would be life and freedom in the lives of those in this place. And all of us corporately, we say, God, would you let our spirit, your spirit rest so powerfully on us that as we worship you and as we act, make that act of worship, you would fill this room with your presence and you would set people free. God, would you give us an anointing that is so powerful that as we carry it with us, we would see people released from bondage and darkness and torment and enslavement.